Welcome to the Mortarboard, the administrator's source for solutions in higher education. We tell you about challenges other schools have faced, benchmark the problem, share their best practices and epic fails, and invite you to consider whether what worked for them might also work at your institution. Hosted by longtime college president Dr. Dan Barwick, this is the Mortarboard, the source for solutions in higher education. Welcome to the Mortarboard, your source for solutions in higher education. I'm Dan Barwick. Welcome to the podcast. If the content of this podcast interests you, then you'll enjoy my new book, Risk and Reward, How Small Colleges Get Better Against the Odds. It's now available from Amazon in ebook, paperback, and audiobook format. The best way to find it is to head over to my blog, mortarboardblog.com, and click on the link on the front page. If you have any thoughts about the book, don't hesitate to send me an email and let me know what you think. My guest today is Audrey Waters, a writer and independent scholar who focuses on education technology, its politics, and its pedagogical implications. She is a freelance writer who has written for The Baffler, The Atlantic, Vice, Hybrid Pedagogy, Inside Higher Ed, The School Library Journal, and elsewhere across the web, but she's best known for her work on her own website, Hack Education. Audrey has given keynotes and presentations on education technology around the world and is the author of several books, including The Monsters of Education Technology, The Revenge of the Monsters of Education Technology, The Curse of the Monsters of Education Technology, The Monsters of Education Technology 4, and Claim Your Domain. Her latest book, Teaching Machines from MIT Press, examines the prehistory of personalized learning. She was the recipient of the Spencer Education Journalism Fellowship at Columbia University for the 2017-2018 academic year. Audrey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. On the front page of your website, you describe yourself, uh, among other things, as Tech Ed's Cassandra. I think that most of us think we understand what that might mean, (laughs) but can you tell me what it means to you? Sure. You know, I would say, first of all, that it's not a label that I chose. Uh, Other people started calling me this. I don't think that anyone would choose to be Cassandra, for a number of reasons, particularly if you're familiar with the story, things didn't work right. out so <laughs> well <true>. for her. <laughs> but of course, Cassandra, you know, Cassandra was the Trojan priestess who was known for for her doomsaying, for prophesizing, for prophecies that were um, rather dour, um, and she warned people uh, not to wheel in that large, shiny. A horse that was parked outside the city walls. And of course, no one listened to her and they did. And that is, I think, something that feels very familiar with me. I've been a, a critic, um, a critic for over a decade now, writing about the, the dangers really of some of the ways in which uh, ed tech is created, disseminated, developed, imagined, sold, um, particularly around issues of data funding, ideology, um, and yet everyone seems um, more than happy to let the shiny horse inside the institution. Um, and, you know, uh, despite despite my cautioning. <laughs> I love that. Well, now there's a list on your blog and uh, in the liner notes of the show, uh, we'll, of course, put a link to your blog. It's it's incredibly fun to read the different articles that you've posted and not just fun, they're they're truly thought provoking. By far the funnest one to read in my opinion is an article entitled The 100 Worst Tech Ed Debacles of the Decade. <laughs> uh now, a lot of people would ask you about, you know, your top your top one or two items. But I'm actually going to ask you first about number 92. Um, to remind you, that is the flipped classroom. I, I personally know at least a dozen teachers who use some version of the flipped classroom. And although, and most of those, uh, I believe all of those but one are college teachers. Can you take us through what gives you pause about that approach? Sure. You know, I think 
there are there are a number of things. One I would say um, to 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 your setup is, I think that what you said is very common. We tend to rely on what I call anecdata, right? So we hear stories about ed tech being used successfully, and from that we just assume, I think, that it means that it's successful. Um, and often it's, you know, we do, we all do know one or two people who are particularly innovative when it comes to technology, who seem to use, incorporate technology in their classroom in interesting and exciting ways that benefit um, them, the professor, but also the students. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's great for everybody and great in all circumstances. The other thing I would add is that my background is actually not in education or education psychology or education technology or technology. I'm a humanities person. And as a literature person, I think um, those of us who study that, who've taught that, we, that, this is the flipped classroom in some ways is exactly what we do. We say, we're going to read this novel. I want you to go home, read the novel, come back into the classroom, and we'll talk about the novel. So in some ways, the flipping... Uh, is very familiar to people in the humanities. However, um, around 2011, Saul Khan gave a TED Talk where he sort of, and as a non-humanities person, where he sort of acted as though he'd invented this idea of having folks do the sort of do the reading outside of the classroom and then use the classroom time, not for lecture, uh, but for discussion and for problem solving. And for me, that's, I, I am always really wary when people seem to have no understanding of the history of education or the history of education technology. And Saul Khan's a really great example of that. Of course, for a very long time, people have, um, people have used this practice, but well before he popularized it in his TED talk, there were other, there were other people, um, a friend of mine, Carl Fish, a math teacher who also wrote about this on his blog in the early 2000s that, you know, he would upload some of his explanations to YouTube um, for his students. And then in the classroom, um, he, he worked in high school, he would, you know, be able to do exercises with with the students, and I think that part of the problem, um, part of the problem, why I see it as a debacle, is it really, in some ways, exemplifies this kind of uh, fervor over ed tech narratives that seem to sweep us up in things. Right, the uh, this idea that somehow a tech person, a tech guru has invented this thing that's going to revolutionize and fix education forever. And I'm, again, I'm super suspicious when I hear those kinds of stories. I mean, you know, the part of the critique that Khan and others say is that lectures are terrible. Uh, we're, we're wasting time doing lectures. But then I wonder, well, why are they better when they're on? Why, why are somehow videotaped lectures superior? I think, you know, the the other problem is that we know, particularly, I think, at the K-12 level, I'm not sure how, how much it applies at the college level, but we know that homework isn't necessarily such a great idea either. And so a lot of the flipped classroom, particularly at the K through 12 level, relies on just on, on homework in a way that I think has all sorts of issues around educational inequality, whose who's home space, and we've seen this during the pandemic, whose home space is really conducive to doing this kind of work uh, outside of school. That's a very long-winded answer for you. I'm sorry. Not at all. Uh, that's fascinating because, of course, your discussion of how the flipped classroom had existed prior reminds me, you know, of my graduate work. So I'm, of course, my background's in the humanities as well, philosophy, and um, in my graduate courses, you know, there, I, I can't actually recall almost any lecture. Um, you know, the teachers expected you to have completely familiarized yourself with the material prior to the class. And then you would use the class time to e either ask questions about parts that puzzled you or, you know, basically have some kind of round table discussion about those sort of the more important points of the reading. And, um, it never actually occurred to me until you just described it now that, well, wait, why isn't that a a flipped classroom. <laughs> because we humanities people were no good at marketing our ideas. I think that's You why. might be right. <laughs> uh, as as 
as someone in the field of philosophy, I, actually, I suspect you're very right. Let me uh, uh, ask you about number 86 on that same list. It's the continued darling of not just tech ed, but education more generally, which is badges. Uh, you wrote, and here I'm going to quote you, it's not clear that digital badges have provided us with a really meaningful way to assess skills or expertise, end quote. Now, I'd love to, for you to explain this. So let's say that I get a badge following an exam. Uh, and let's assume that it was a good exam that actually uh, measured something that I had some skill I'd acquired or some knowledge I'd acquired. If so, if the passing grade on the test accurately assessed my skill, why isn't a badge just as accurate as the you know more normal expression of how I had done, which is would be say in my a grade report? So I would say that for, you're in your hypothetical that assume that the the test is 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 good is a huge assumption. I mean, I think that that's one of the problems that we face. Um, not just, I mean, in the kinds of tests that we use in day to day in the classroom uh, versus the, or as all the way up to the kinds of exams, the kinds of standardized tests that the, of the SAT and the GRE. Uh, I think that there's a lot, there's a lot of work around what goes into making a good test. And I'm not sure that we, <laughs> hundred plus years into standardized testing have kind of nailed that one. I think it's actually a really challenging problem. But the other thing with badges is that in some ways they've been presented as a credential and credentials are also really complicated and they are wrapped up not just in demonstrating what you know, but they're wrapped up in all sorts of other elements of social capital and prestige, right? A badge, if you will, a degree, a diploma um, means certain things. And it means certain things when it comes from certain institutions. And those aren't, those don't correspond uh, tightly necessarily to your expertise or, or your knowledge. I wouldn't say that somebody that graduates from Harvard, for example, comes away with more knowledge than somebody who graduates from uh, UCLA. Um, <laughs> the Harvard person will insist that they did. <laughs> um, and I think that that's the other, that's, but that's the other piece of badges. And I think the idea between about the idea of introducing a new kind of credential doesn't really wrestle necessarily with that element of prestige. So, you know, what did, what do these things mean? I think we can see some of that play out a couple of years, I guess, almost, gosh, almost a decade after the year of the MOOC, right? The MOOCs were supposed to be part of this disruption of higher education and a different kind of way for students to attain knowledge and then be able to, you know, demonstrate without having to pay tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars for a diploma to be able to, you know, take classes and then show through a badging system that they 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 had the knowledge. And I'm I'm not sure that we recognize the the Coursera courses the same way that we recognize a four year degree. And that's again, that's not a reflection of whether a student knows something or doesn't know something. It's about the social capital that we've attached to credentials. And I think it's just a lot more complicated than the Mozilla folks. And again, these sort of tech narratives that techs that, you know, a new technology is going to come along and sort of disrupt these institutions. It's it's simply a lot more complicated than that. And I think that nowadays everyone's attached a badge to almost everything. I mean, you know, you sign up for a new service uh, and they, they, they badge you. Good job. You, you gave <laughs> us your, your email, add your phone number so we can text you and you'll get a badge. Uh, it's, it's truly meaningless, right? It's, it's a, it's sort of this behavioral reinforcement to get our data from us, but I don't think it means anything. If you can say, I've got, you know, I have seven badges in my Nike run club app because I ran every Sunday for the last you know, seven weeks, big deal. I mean, good for me. My heart is, you know, I'm in great shape, but you know, whatever. <laughs> well, let me ask a clarifying question about that. Um, so badging is, I would say a relatively new phenomena, 
compared, for example, say to um, standard transcripts. And I'm just wondering, is it possible that the problems you're identifying are because we're just not very sophisticated about it? So in the same way that um, – Who's the – can I ask who's the we in that? Uh, I, actually, I I was thinking of – a combination of like the educator who assigns the badge and the consumer, which I, and by consumer, I would mean sort of the person who is being reassured by the presence of the badge. So for example, an employer and you say, well, you know, I, I took this course uh, and, you know, if you want to, you can examine the content of the course carefully and look at all the parts. But I wanted you to know that one of the things I earned in that course was a badge that showed that I passed an exam that demonstrated proficiency in Microsoft Excel. And I'm, th- I'm wondering to myself, it's possible that what we're seeing is uh, just a lack of sophistication. That is, as time goes on, badges that represent, say, <laughs> how fit you are will become to be laughed at just the way you and I just laughed at them. Um, and badges that represent something of high quality will eventually be recognized and that there's some sort of um, learning curve or growth pattern that we still have to go through. When I describe it that way, does that ring alarm bells for you? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think it's, it's possible, of course. I think that what we have though, particularly with these questions of prestige um, and Certain, ki- uh, certain kinds of signaling that I think both the, uh, the student, uh, the prospective employee and the employer and the institution are all interested in signaling, uh, in a, in a certain kind of way. But I think that, you know, I, I think it's, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure if it's about human decision making or if things will change if they get handed over to more algorithmic decision making, which I think we're already seeing in human resources in hiring. Um, a lot of algor- um, use of algorithms to sort of weed out uh, job applications from folks who don't have the right, who don't give off the right data, i.e. the right signal. Um, but I, I'm not, I'm not sure how those things weigh, how those weigh a badge and definitely how they would weigh a badge to po- as opposed to some of the more traditional signals that we already understand. Like what, what does it mean to have an Excel, a badge that says I can use Excel, uh, is that, a, is that meaningful to somebody or, you know, like many in the tech world, are they just going to give their own test to prospective, empl- uh, prospective employees? Are they just, you know, the, is the, is the badge going to be meaningful and will it displace these mm, o- older forms of credentialing that we have? And, and I don't, I don't know. I think that I mean, I think that you hear a lot of talk about this. You hear this at, at Google, for example, they'll say, oh, we don't look at transcripts. I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know who looks at, tra- I mean, grad school looks at transcripts, but nobody else yeah, looks at transcripts. I, no one says, you know, you got a C in, you know, 17th century French poetry, Audrey. I'm sorry. You're not, yeah. <laughs> I didn't, by the way. But, you know, I mean, no, but nobody, nobody looks at transcripts except for academics. Well, Bless their hearts. Well, you know, I think that, I, this this conversation is just fascinating to me. That's why I keep asking these clarifying questions because I think I'm beginning to understand why I needed clarification about your response. So when you responded to me, you talked about it in term of, terms of prestige. And it's funny because I, I have to be honest, I, I don't actually associate that with badges. I think my framework is just different and it's kind of, it's almost embarrassing to tell you the kinds of ways that like I'm framed badges in my mind. So I'll give you the embarrassing example first to get it out of the way, which is that I've never, I've never mentioned this before on the podcast, but so I'm an amateur radio operator. You know, I have a ham radio license and you, this is like, I think of it as a badge that you 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 pass a test that is supplied by the federal government. There's no other way to get the license, and but if if you walk into um, if if you're talking to say um, 
an, an emergency response coordinator for some county and they want to know if you can be useful to them, if you simply say that you have this license, which honestly I think of as as a badge, but perhaps I shouldn't, it immediately conveys the only thing that's relevant, which is that you've passed an exam that uh, has an incredibly specific set of things it is measuring about your skill set. And it would be pretty, it would be, I, I don't think anybody could just walk into the exam and pass it by accident um, because it's ridiculously technical and kind of almost a humorously over the top technical way. Then the second thing I think about is most of my academic experience is in technical education. So I, I, I worked first for a college of technology, then for a community college that had many technical degrees. Now I, I work for a college of health and human services in which most of the credentials that we offer are quite technical in the healthcare field. And I think to myself, any of the credentials that come out of those things, they're not prestige. They actually signal not prestige, but actual somebody of, of knowledge. When I describe these alternatives to you, how do you see them? I think that they are still intertwined with social capital and professional capital, right? I mean, I think that the the credentialing bodies, even the licensing body for ham radio is, I think, interested in retaining um, the uh, ham radio operation as being something that is uh, distinct and distinctive. They want quality. Um, I don't know that it's, it's certainly not prestige the same way as the Ivy League. Uh, would That's for that sure. Prestige. But I do think, <laughs> I, <laughs> but I do think that the, that there is still a distinction between the ham radio and the not ham radio um, person, and so I think that it is something that does differentiate. I think that different professional bodies uh, have this uh, in which um, you know you you do want to be able to you do want to be able to demonstrate have. Um, be sure that the people who are joining your profession have a particular set of knowledge and sometimes overlap with a particular set of beliefs and practices. Um, so I, I do think it's connected to to social capital. I think that, um, and you know, I think that that there that that there are lots of ways in which we have these kinds of credentialing credentialing systems outside of academia. I think the thing with badges though is that again it's it's this sort of tech notion that what we, that that we can simply just disrupt we can just disrupt the system this long running institutional practice all of the meaning that we had that is accrued in the diploma even in the licensing we can disrupt it with with a piece of tech um, and that we can sort of uh, we can make it free we can make it easy to access. Um, we can, um, I think as, as, you know, I think as, as people describe these, we will revolutionize uh, higher education with something like the badge. And again, I think the world is just, it's just a lot more complicated and credentials because they are associated with social capital. I don't think that you can just offer an alternative and have people agree that it means the same thing, right? If, if somebody decided that they want to offer an alternative to the, the official ham license, I don't think that that emergency um, provider at the state level is going to be like, yeah, you know, it's kind of a pain in the butt to pass the ham, the ham uh, radio license. This other guy has a badge. It, you know, he got it online, whatever. I, I just don't think it's, I don't think that those things are as quick, as quickly uh, replace these traditional forms of, of licensing. Let me ask a further follow up because that your your description of your skepticism about disruption is just fascinating. Um, I got to figure out how to ask this question just right. Um, I'm I'm wondering what you think will be disruptive about technology. And when I say that, let me let me just make sure I'm asking it the right way. So I've, you know, I'm 53 years old and I've watched in the last two decades technology disrupt many, many things. Everything from doing my taxes to getting a cab is now done in a different way, you know, than it was, say, two decades ago. It has been 
I think without using a cliche, I think it has been disrupted by technology. And if you think that these things like say badges don't have the, I'm not sure that capability or capacity is the right, are the right words. But if you don't think that they are going to disrupt it in the way we think they will, I'm curious as what, what, if anything about technology, do you think has the capacity to disrupt and, and disrupt, by the way, given what I've read of your writing, I'll, I'll qualify that by saying disrupt it in a positive way. (laughs) <laughs> because okay, I, well, that- <laughs> because because I, I I I guess that you would say that some of the disruption, maybe most, maybe even all of the disruption that's occurred, there is a there's it's taken us backwards in some way, and I'm wondering what value in a in a disruption you might eventually think you eventually will see. Yeah, I think that I mean I think that your your little addendum there has <laughs> thrown you for a loop. <laughs> tricky. You know, that the in in the Star Trek world, there was sort of one weapon that was the really bad weapon that you weren't supposed to use, right? And that was the disruptor. This was like the Romulans. Oh, that's um, right. This, the, right. The the Romulans were the ones who you had this the sort of malevolent, really malevolent, dangerous technology, and it was it was the disruptor. Um the one the one kind of weapon that we that uh, the Star Trek world decided to ban. Um, so I you know I think that, I think that, dis- and I think that disruption, again, I'm not directly going to answer your question. I think I'm going to, I'll get to it eventually. It's okay. Disruption, I think is really challenging, particularly when we talk about education. You know, I think that education is, I think in, in education, we are, um, we are investing time. We're investing um, money um, in uh, the prospects for a particular future, um, both on an individual and a social level. And I think it gets really tricky, um, particularly at the K through 12 level, but also in higher ed, when the disruption comes for sort of other, other people's children. Um, the disruption is something that happens to them to improve that rather than the things that may ne- necessarily would do to ourselves. I think that it I think that it can just be complicated and and disruption. I mean, it's the word, the word doesn't, the word has a positive connotation around people who see innovation as being exciting and up that kind of upheaval is, is exciting and perhaps um, wildly profit profitable. Uh, but I think that disruption is, is not a pleasant experience in general. So to be excited about disruption, I think, you know, what what kind of what kind of world do we envision in the future? What exactly are we willing to change? What kind of upheaval um, can we tolerate? And not just personally, um, but socially, and with a responsibility not just for ourselves, but for sort of future generations. And I think that that means we need to take this idea of disruption really quite seriously um, when we are seeking to uh, seeking to make these kinds of changes that will challenge the way in which people's livelihoods are made, challenge the kind of investment of time and energy that a lot of students um, are making that a lot of faculty have made in order to, to become professors. You know, I think that technology, I, I, I am often called in a sneering term, a Luddite. And I would say, yeah, actually, I am a, I am a Luddite. Um, and I, I'm happy to be called a Luddite because I understand history and I actually know what the Luddites were interested in. And the Luddites weren't anti-technology. The Luddites were weavers. The Luddites were used to working with technology. The, they, they used looms. They weren't weaving by hand. They were you they were using machinery. What the Luddites were opposed to was the idea that the machinery would be owned by factory workers and that their labor would be extracted from them and that they would no longer be in control of the decisions that they made with their time, the output of their labor. And I think that that's something to keep in mind when we think about technology. Uh, are we sort of handing over control of our lives on a personal, on a communal, on a social, on an institutional level 
to um, two technologies that are going to extract extract value from us, extract our cloth, if you will, and run off to market with us. And that's the kind of disruption I think that most technologists are talking about. Is I think it's a it's a disruption that's uh, in the end at the end of the day. Uh, about extracting value, extracting data, but extract, extracting monetary value from institutions, from educational institutions, from students, uh, from what students are doing, and and making money from that. And I I'm not sure that that's really the the mission of a university. And unfortunately, I think that that's has become what so many people in tech are interested in is this financial disruption um, at the at the end of the day. Well, I think that that answer is pro- probably previews your answer to my next question. Um, in your latest book, Teaching Machines, you challenge what you call, quote, the teleology of ed tech. Uh, the idea that not only is computerized education inevitable, but technological progress is the sole driver of events. Is computerized education inevitable? And I have to admit, I'm asking you that question because it does feel that way to me. I don't think that the, I think that the future is, is unwritten. I think that we have the ability to make the future um, in different kinds of ways. I think that there, when when I hear that the, something is inevitable, immediately I have a lot of questions about why we have no power politically, uh, individually, why we have no power to make change. That sounds like a story in which we're all supposed to give up and surrender. Um, I think that the, what the future will look like and what the future will look like technologically is is really unwritten. I know that people say, well, now with the pandemic in particular, things have moved online. There's no going back. Uh, I I mean, f- well, I mean, we can't go back because that's not how time works. <laughs> but I think that going forward, we should, we, we don't necessarily have to use more and more tech or even use tech in a certain kind of way. I think that we actually have the power to resist and refuse and to reshape what technology looks like and what our institutions look like, what our practices look like. I think that one of the things that technology does is it brings with it a, a, a huge amount of ideologies and, and practices that are sort of hard coded into it. Um, my book, Teaching Machines, looks at really what's been a hundred plus year old effort by educational psychologists and technologists to automate education. This is something that people were imagining and building, not just writing fantastic stories about, but actually building in the early 1900s with the rise of educational technology and educational testing. This idea that if we can just get enough data, we'll be able to track track students, understand each student individually, and then automate education to meet their in to meet each of their individual needs. This is a very old story. And as, as technologies have been built, the education technologies, the teaching machines that Skinner built, for example, in the 1950s and 60s, as this gets built, a lot of these practices around this get hard-coded. And they've been hard-coded into a lot of the computing technologies that, we, um, that were designed and built in the 70s and 80s, took with them these sort of pre-digital practices. And I think that when we know history, we can sort of see the ways in which things aren't natural, that things are constructed, and we can build something different. We can decide that our practices perhaps are exploitative. We can look at the ways in which perhaps our pedagogy is based on behaviorism. Um, And we can build something different. We can design something different. So I don't know. I don't think that we're stuck with what technology looks like now and that in perpetuity, that's what it will look like forever and ever. I think education has always changed. And and I am really hopeful that we can make drastic changes to what the future of education looks like. But I don't think it has to simply look like what it looks like um, what it looked like before, but now somehow it's digital. Or or I think we can, we can build something better. We can build something that's not reliant on these sort of older practices 
and the sort of older model, which is extract as much value as you can out of the students so you can automate education and get rid of the pesky labor unions uh, and teachers. <laughs> well, actually, when you say that you're hopeful about the future, that's that's a nice segue into my final question for you, which is sort of I'm thinking – with the overall fascination and and the embrace of tech ed and and the embrace seems to me to be undeniable even though uh there's obvious reservations that one could have about it do you feel like you're shouting into the void you know what what's next for you um do you feel discouraged i don't think everybody i don't think everybody loves technology students don't love technology I mean, I think if you ask students how their experience was um, during the pandemic, they're, they are not going to say, well, it was amazing. I, I absolutely loved spending every day on Zoom. Boy, at these classes, I learned so much. I really connected with my peers. My college experience has just been phenomenal. Give me more tech. No, I, I don't think that, I don't think that students, um, at almost any grade level, um, love technology. In fact, I think that, interestingly, I think that the dislike of education technology is a motivator for a lot of people to go out and build what they think is the, a better learning management system. If you ask a lot of ed tech entrepreneurs, like, why did you decide to to get into ed tech? Often they'll say, well, I, I had to use Blackboard and it really sucked. And so I wanted to build something different. I, know, I don't know who loves ed tech. I mean, but not not a lot of people do. It's it's the the technology that we use in and out of the classroom. It's not great. It's it's just it's just not. <laughs> well, great. just to be clear, I actually described it as a fascination and embrace of ed tech, not a love for it. And I agree. I agree with you that you know students are often bored um, or not engaged in important ways, and there's a lack of perhaps connection between them. And their peers, or even between them and the teacher, that wouldn't necessarily that, that would would be better if the instruction were in person. At the same time, and I'm saying this because I I teach every semester, I feel like my students are caught in the same the same sort of um, belief system that you've described, where they think this could be better. And at that point, if it were better, I would like it. I don't like it now. <laughs> and they th- and and so like uh, those people, maybe they're the ones who become the tech ed developers that you just described. <laughs> um, uh, the feeling I get from students is that their experience is very, very uneven, um, and that there are occasionally these glimpses of courses that are, say, more engaging rather than less. And they think, oh wait, this could this could be better. And even though I freely admit it may you often not be. I, I and in fairness, I would say that that is not even necessarily a technological question, right? I mean, I think we've all had great classes and we've all sat in some yeah. pretty terrible classes. And I think you know, as someone who taught for a long time, we've. We've done our share of teaching some not great classes and ones in which we were just absolutely the whole classroom was on fire. So, I mean, I I don't know that that's necessarily simply a technology question, but I think that when we introduce technology, uh, a lot of the things that we can do in the classroom are really quite circumscribed. I often, again, as the humanities person, you know, one of the things that I would say one of my favorite technologies, my favorite education technologies is the window because the window have teaching in a classroom with windows, being a student in a classroom with windows, um, and then versus being in getting assigned to teach or have classes in one of those dungeon rooms um, is just incredibly different experience. The ability to have sunlight while you are teaching and learning or doing anything really makes a huge difference. We don't often think about um, the window as an education technology. We don't think about heating or air conditioning, but these are all technologies in the classroom. The other one is the chairs in the classroom 
Are you, are you teaching or are you a student in the classroom where you can move the furniture around? As a humanities person, one of the first things that we often do is say, okay, I know that the last class had it in rows, but we're going to put everything in a circle. I'm with you. We're big, we're big circle people in the humanities. Um, the, the science people, they like the rows, but we're like, let's, let's get in a circle. Um, but when you teach with technology, you are less able to, if you go with me with the analogy here, put the chairs in a circle, right? You are kind of stuck with the ways in which the designer, the engineer of the software imagined your teaching to look like, imagined the learning to look like. So the kinds of pedagogical um, freedoms that you might have as an instructor are really limited often by, by the use of technology. You can't just sort of Jimmy open Zoom and say, well, this, this sort of way in which Zoom works in which we're these sort of, uh, rows of, you know, rows of, of headshots. Uh, we're going to, we're going to do that differently and we're going to put everyone in a, in a circle. We just don't have that, that capability. And so I, I think that, I mean, I think that it, that there are, I think that there are these kind of limitations, limitations to what our teaching can look like online that we don't, um, that I think uh, that raise all sorts of, raise all sorts of questions for me about what the future, what the future of teaching and learning can look like if it becomes this highly engineered ordeal. And the other thing I would add is that the question is if, if, if students are kind of ugh, about technology, and I think a lot of professors are also kind of ugh, about technology, what is it that's the great appeal to administrators? And I think that that's a question that's really important to do some some soul searching on. Is it is it that you believe that you are adopting something that's innovative? What is exactly does that mean? Why is it innovative? If you dig a little deeper, can you find that actually this is an idea? like the teaching machine that is a century old, so maybe not so innovative, but also is it simply about efficiency? Um, and are the values, again, are these values, do they really align with what the values of the mission of the university are? Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe there are some universities whose mission statement uses the word efficiency, but I don't know that there are that many that say, we're going to, we're going to get the kids in and out of here as quickly as possible. God damn it. For as little money as <laughs> we could possibly spend. I don't think that's a mission statement of, of higher education. And yet that seems to be the mission statement of a lot of tech um, in general. That's why we, we like to use tech because we think it's going to make things cheaper, better, faster. Um, and does that coincide with the kind of experience that we see as cultivating um, at the university. My guest has been Audrey Waters, a writer and independent scholar who focuses on education technology. She was the recipient of the Spencer Education Journalism Fellowship at Columbia University for the 2017-2018 academic year, and her latest book is Teaching Machines from MIT Press, which examines the prehistory of personalized learning. Audrey Waters, thanks for being with me on the podcast today and for giving us food for thought about what might really constitute innovation in higher education. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Please feel free to email me with questions, comments, or suggestions for content that you'd like to hear about. You can reach me at mortarboardpodcast at gmail.com. Consider stopping by my blog, mortarboardblog.com. The blog contains links to stories that I think will interest you, podcast transcripts, and articles I've written. You can also like me on Facebook at Dr. Daniel Barwick or follow me on Twitter at Daniel Barwick. Looking forward to talking with you in the next episode.